I haven't been making that many uh, proper videos lately. Uh, over Christmas, of course, there was no time, and after that, with kids home from school, it's hard to find the time, which means I actually didn't upload a video on either of my channels for almost a month. But I have published one on my main channel lately, so at least I'm getting back in the swing of things. And I've actually got another video that's just about ready to go, but uh, it's a sponsored video, and the sponsor would rather pay me before I publish it. So hopefully uh, that'll be ready to go out later this week. We'll see. The sponsored video thing is something I'm getting a little bit more into lately. Uh, I did the EcoFlow video back in the summer-ish, and that was a sponsored video, and the experience for that was actually not too bad, so um, that type of sponsored video is okay. I've also been trying to do an ad spot for a VPN company. They pay quite well for the ad spots, way more than uh, YouTube pays, but the problem is, of course, they have all the things that they want saying they don't necessarily want to say. I did find sort of a different angle on the VPN idea, so I thought I'd be okay doing a spot, and I shot one. It took me a whole day to do it, because I have a hard time doing that sort of thing. And they're like, well, you got to talk more about our VPN, not just VPNs. So I may try to reshoot that. I was going to put that in the video that I actually uploaded last Sunday, I think? No, Friday. Um, but they weren't okay with it, and I was like, I just want to get a video out there. I'm not going to reshoot this again, spending a whole day and then waiting for your approval. So if it is going to happen, it's going to happen in a later video. And a quick update on the oil level sensor thing that I made in here. That's uh, this thing in here. That's got this uh, distance sensor on it to measure the oil level. Man, that thing is flaky. Uh, these sensors, uh, like this one here, they just are kind of uh, tinker grade sensors and they just aren't reliable. But in the meantime, a reader sent me a new oil level gauge because this old mechanical one was broken. The float just doesn't float anymore. So at least I've got a backup for this one. Although this one is working often enough that I don't check this one anymore. And while I'm out here, let's go in the shed. I'll show you what I've got going there. It's always a little bit warmer in here. So I got a Raspberry Pi and a whole bunch of temperature sensors. This is all for this uh, sponsored video, which uh, hopefully will be coming out soon. I also ended up uh, adding a wireless access point to the shed because I ran an ethernet cable out here when I ran power and that was very handy because the Wi-Fi to this thing just barely worked to the house, but with an access point in here, works great. But these uh, ultrasonic distance sensors, they very much remind me of uh, the DHT22 sensors. Both of these are meant to be easily bit banged from an Arduino, which I think is what the uh, what the target audience for those is, and they're both flaky as hell. The uh, problem with the DHT22 sensor is they work great at room temperature, but as soon as you uh, subject them to outdoor conditions when it's cool, they start flaking out. Which is kind of ironic for a temperature sensor, because it's supposed to go down to minus 20 degrees, and it does, it just gets really flaky. Temperature sensors that only work at room temperature. <laughs> Who would have thought, eh? But I find uh, basically sensors that use an I2C protocol, those ones generally tend to be reliable because even the cheap Chinese ones are designed to go into product. And stuff that goes into product just has to work a lot better than stuff for tinkerers. And speaking of cheap Chinese sensors, uh, these are Chinese clones of 18B20 sensors off of Amazon or eBay. And they cost about 50 cents a piece. But uh, they are inaccurate uh, and noisy and the worst part is sometimes they latch up or have to power down the whole thing to get it to work again. Um, so I've actually ended up buying some real 18B20s which cost about $4 US a piece. That's quite expensive. But uh, those ones are a much cleaner signal and they work reliably. But for the most part I've actually had pretty good luck with uh, cheap Chinese sensors. Uh, basically if you buy anything off of eBay or AliExpress and it's a good price it's some kind of Chinese imitation of the thing that you're looking for. But uh, things like BME-280s or BMP-280s or load cell amplifiers, uh, those have worked pretty good for me. Uh, A to D converters, eh, a little bit hit and miss, but overall not too bad. And I've been buying a fair number of these sensors, uh, all for experiment type videos, and those almost always involve a Raspberry Pi connected to a bunch of sensors and logging the data as I do some kind of mechanical or thermal experiment. And the videos on that have actually been doing fairly well. Not as well as project videos used to do, but my project videos don't do as well as they used to do, so 
the experiments are actually doing relatively well and I quite enjoy doing that sort of thing because in that sort of video I end up learning something too. I'm always curious what the results are going to be. And the experiment videos doing well is what motivated me to build this whole strength testing apparatus. And uh, once I'm done with this video, I'll do some more tests on this because somebody sent me some lilac and sweet gum wood to test. And it should be relatively straightforward to just run those through because it's relatively automated. And I've got a whole list of videos that I'd still like to do with that strength testing apparatus. It's just I don't want to do them all in a row because if there was 10 videos with that apparatus, I think it would get kind of boring for a lot of people. And speaking of videos that not everyone likes, I've been getting a bit more into making shorts lately. I don't like this whole idea of everything going to mobile and TikTokification of things, but I've realized actually to some extent I've been making shorts all along, or at least I've made the occasional video that was less than a minute long. And the shorts format is kind of great for setting the expectation of this is not a serious video, this is just a quick little novel video, so shorts are great for that. What I don't like is the vertical aspect ratio because most of my regular audience, I think, views them on a computer or a tablet, and that just looks terrible. But uh, I've been experimenting. The most recent short is actually only one pixel higher than it's wide, so it's still in portrait format. Um, but Googling around, actually, shorts can be square, so I think my future shorts will all be square, because that's kind of a good compromise for working well on mobile and working well on desktop. In fact, if you look on Facebook, a lot of videos on Facebook are square, so again, it's a good compromise between mobile and desktop. So I think I will be going back to videos that are like seven, ten years old, that sort of thing that I think very few people remember. Some of those that are very short to begin with and editing them down to a short. And when I revisit a video, I can usually do a better job of the edit because just by not having shot it straight away, it's much easier to see stuff that's not that exciting that you can cut out. So I uploaded a video like that uh, just yesterday, um, which was a video that was originally only 42 seconds long that I shot in 2015. And going over it again is now 30 seconds long and it's uploaded as a shorts. And at least for the first 20 hours or so, it's actually done better than my other shorts. Shorts for me don't usually do as well as the regular videos, but it's less effort and I know some people enjoy them and if you don't, just don't watch them. It's easy enough to see that it's a short without clicking on it. But there's not a whole lot of money to be made on shorts on mobile. So this is my most successful short with it's got uh, 300,000 views. And let's look on here. This is the views over time excluding the first day because that was a big spike. But we look at revenue. Um, that was just initially and then it kind of drops off to pretty much nothing. So what gives? But if we look on here at traffic sources, um, the green line is actually regular YouTube and the blue line is essentially uh, the shorts feed. So the shorts feed uh, really picked up after the initial thing. So here's regular YouTube dropping off and the shorts feed picked up after that. And looking at the uh, revenue, basically there was money to be made while it was on regular YouTube. And this big surge on shorts resulted in zero revenue. So if you see somebody really killing it with shorts, making lots they get like a million views, they're not killing it with ad revenue because probably YouTube hasn't figured out how to actually monetize those shorts on mobile yet. Right now I think their push is to kind of get established in there against TikTok and all that and maybe they'll figure out how to make money off of it later. And last year I did a uh, five year update video on my belt sander which people quite enjoyed. And some people have been asking about my jointer and that jointer is now 10 years old. So I figure I might make an update video on that. Uh, nothing's gone wrong with it or anything like that but just, just to tell you what my experience has been over the last 10 years and then probably another video. I want to put this big honking motor on that jointer which should make it quieter. I already bought the uh, belt for it. Uh, the belt ended up costing more than the motor because I got a great deal on the motor. So that will probably be another upcoming video. And a bit more about that oil level thingy. This was my initial oil level readings here, which is just a temperature effect. We weren't actually using the oil furnace yet. I published it here and the next day the readings just went all haywire. And then it stopped getting readings altogether and here is where I fixed it, where it went back to normal. And then looking at the last 14 days, at least the uh, base readings, the lowest readings, seem to be fairly consistent. Uh, although every once in a while it spikes high. 
and here it just went flaky altogether and here it flaked out I had to reset the Pi to get it to work again that might be a software issue on my part but overall we can see how the oil level declines and it declines more in the mornings because of course that's when we use more oil to warm up the house and I think the main reason the oil level sensor flaked out altogether is actually condensation I taken a screenshot when I scoped out the ultrasonic transducer signals and uh, this is exciting the uh, sender and you can see there's a bit of wiggles on the tops and bottoms of these and they get stronger after the uh, eight pulses or so and then here they keep going and then they die off so what's happening is this transducer is exactly tuned to 40 kilohertz and those eight pulses kind of excite it and then it vibrates for a while and dies down and similarly the receiver is tuned in the same way so it has to operate at exactly 40 kilohertz because that's what it's tuned for and that sensor had flaked out on me after several mild days and then suddenly it turned really cold so I think what happened is that the heating oil stayed a bit warmer and the sensor was at the top of the tank which was cold because the outside is cold and so a tiny bit of the oil evaporated and condensed on the actual transducers making them heavier and throwing them out of tune and that made the whole thing stop working and then once it got warmer again I think then the oil was able to evaporate off of my transducer again and then it started working again and since then I haven't had it flaking out completely all that much so I think I want to replace it with an optical sort of distance sensor but I won't be doing that this year